excited to have the Eubank family here, uh, Dave and Karen and Pete. You guys all coming up at first? Yeah, so we're going to inv invite you guys on up, and uh, we're just going to give them the evening. And so, these guys... Not just Dave, but Karen and Pete here. These guys are, you can come, right, come on right on up. These guys are my heroes. I love these guys. And I, if I have one thing to say, I want to say, what you see, what you hear, is who they are on the stage, off the stage, when we've traveled together, when we've been in different places. I love these guys. And just so real, so transparent. And so, thanks for loving Jesus. And we're looking forward to hearing from you guys. I'm going to pass it off to you. Welcome to the Eubank family. Thanks. We love you all. And for those that, there's some good friends of mine. Scott McEwen, he's an author. He wrote, uh, he co-wrote American Sniper. Just a great guy. He can't make it here. So if you're watching, I told him, get, get on live stream, man. You won't die of boredom or you can sleep. And uh, Chaplain Jason Hohenberger, their family's right there. He's prayed me through some bad situations. It's the power of prayer. Your pastors too. Dan and Larry and Brian have prayed us through things. God works powerfully through prayers. I know it. I feel it. And so, Jason, if you're watching, I love you, brother. He also is very good with a Glock, better than me. And I love him. I'm glad you all are here. And then I've got, we've got friends, Molly and her friends. Um, her brother, John Moore, is our webmaster. And so we have all kinds of friends here. Uh, and, and then, of course, there's y'all, the, the main effort. But I'm really grateful to be here. And somebody, one of Molly's friends said, we're excited to be here. I said, yeah, because this is Jesus' house. And you can feel it. And I've always felt that. And, and who is, what's the name of the, the, the lady singers? Well, the guy singer, I already know he's good. But these girls can sing. I was like, who are these people? So thank you. And Pete and Karen introduce themselves. Good afternoon or good evening. My name is Peter Eubank. I am 16 years old. I'm Dave's only son. I'm the last of three children. My two sisters, though they wish they could be here, are in college in Texas A&M University in Texas. So they're not here right now. Whoop. And uh, <laughs> I hope to go there someday as a, probably go to the army through there. But anyway, my name is Peter. I'm wearing a traditional outfit from Karen State Burma. This is what the men wear. It's called a loungy. It's like a tubular towel, but very useful. And this is a basket from Kareni State Burma, just above Karen State Burma on the eastern side. And the lady that we got this from, about one week after we left her village, the Burma army came through and attacked it and mortared it, and she had to run away from her home, and she still has not been able to come back to her home. So please continue to pray for Burma. Thank you. Yes, it always feels like an amazing homecoming, a big family reunion, seeing you all and seeing your prayers and so many hugs and prayers and love from, and I just know you're with us wherever we go. Uh, that's a huge gift. It keeps us afloat in so many ways. I, people, I say, I don't even know what we need prayer for. Thank you for doing that. Um, during our uh, Good Life Club Children's Program, on our last June mission in Karini State, Burma, I felt scripture come to life. The fam displaced families that we were visiting were still in close proximity to their village that was at that point occupied by the Burma army. And their hiding site, kind of the little tent village, was still within proximity of Burma army shelling, mortar shelling. Even the rangers that we were with, which are the men and women who want to do these relief, mis relief missions and that children's program, they were a little bit nervous about the precariousness of the situation too. When we arrived, we were met by some children that had already gathered and were waiting for us. And there were a few adults also, although they were pretty anxious, waiting for the sounds of fighting to begin or watching the sky for aircraft that might see our gathering as a target for attack. But we knew the drill and we got going with songs. I said, let's get going with this right away in case we get interrupted. And as they started with the songs, the kids who are always eager for attention, they heartily joined in. Well, that made the Rangers more animated in their singing and that encouraged the adults more who had gathered to become 
dancing and jumping along with us. And then that gave more humor and energy to the Rangers until all of a sudden everybody was howling with laughter at this drama and the jokes and the stories. And I stepped back and I felt I could see that verse, perfect love casts out fear coming to life. It was like there was this big bubble over us. This love that was pouring out between the rangers and the villagers back and forth was encouraging and, and engaging them all and giving them that, that peace and that joy. And I felt it just happening. You could almost feel it. Well, later as we left, you could see the situation descend, the gravity, the reality of the situation descended. Everybody was so concerned, but there had been this strengthening, this re-infusing of courage, like encouraging that Jesus is always present and he is sovereign and he's guiding and he's comforting and he's leading in every situation. And then watching perfect love cast out fear uh, firsthand can be a profound experience. Even the young rangers, many of whom are not Christian, they're learning about Jesus for the first time through this, were saying, that was so fun. We sang all those songs about Jesus and everybody was happy and I forgot what I was worried about. I could make people happy all day long if I was doing this. This is so great. I'd never get tired doing this. Um, and so we could share, this is what happens. And I know for all of us, we have so many things to be afraid of every single day. And yet Jesus has given us a tool. It's this tool that when you look fear in the eye with this perfect love of Jesus, it takes away that debilitating effect. It infuses you with courage and strength. And so that's my encouragement for all of us to use those tools that Jesus has given us, his perfect love in every situation. Thank you. Thank you. Back to the pastor. Or should I use that one? Try that one. Thanks. Hello? Okay, good. So I'd like to pray. Lord Jesus, thanks for the power of your name and your person. Thanks for forgiving our sins and giving us a new start every day. And thank you for tonight. And we put it all back in your hands for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, when we got here, I saw this card in the Mission Guest House. And thanks again, whoever donated that. Um, if God leads you to donate things um, to this church, I, I would do it if I was you. Uh, well, at least we're benefiting, and a lot of people are too. But there was a card, and it has a scripture on the front. It says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118, verse 24. And inside, it says, Dave and Karen, we're grateful that the Lord allowed our paths to cross once again. Praying your time here in Mission's house is refreshing. Please enjoy the treats, and there's a ton of them. Like, you could outfit a 10-day backpacking trip out of what I see on that table, and we will. On the table and the refrigerator, there are grocery bags on the counter to pack up all the remainders and bring them on your journey towards Texas, which we also will. There's even, like, fancy drinks of, like, sparkly, all the stuff you see in movies. It's like real water, but I think you pay more. Um, <laughs> Thanks for including us all in your travels. We are praying the Lord uses you to encourage his bride tonight, the bride being the church. In Christ, Calvary, Moretta, missions team. So someone had to do this. Didn't have to, but they did it. And I thought, wow, it's good to be loved. Um, whether you deserve it or not, it's always good. It's good to be forgiven. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, when the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray? And he tells them, and right there it says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. It seems pretty contractual and unfair. But if you want to be forgiven, you got to forgive. And if you ever don't want to forgive somebody, think, have you ever, when you've been caught and about to be punished, have you ever said to someone or God, yeah, punish me a lot, please? No way. You're like, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. And that's what our enemies and those who offended us also want. And the only way I know how to forgive somebody who's really hurt me is to say, Jesus, I will obey you at all cost. If you want me to do that forgiveness thing, which I will, but I can't do it. 
please help me, help me. And he has that kind of power that in spite of yourself, you will find yourself forgiving someone. It's not a psychological event. It's a supernatural event, which has a psychological benefit, but it's supernatural because we are of spirit. Finally, be, before and finally, we're of spirit and God is of spirit and he can heal us, enable us to do what we can't do alone. And in case someone has to leave then early, I want to say the most important thing I can share tonight is that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And he has power to heal us of anything and overcome anything. When we share with tribal people in Burma or with Muslims in Syria and Iraq or recently trying to help the Afghans, I always say something like this. This is not about religion. This is about a relationship with a living God who sent his son to live and die for us. For these reasons, among many, one, to forgive us our sins and draw us into relationship as children of God. Number two, to give us purpose and missions in our lives. Number three, to overcome the power of demons and the devil himself. And number four, to take us to heaven. Th this is what he does for us. And part of the meaning and purpose and forgiveness and power in our lives, I experienced recently. Um, some of y'all know us, and we didn't, I didn't go to special forces or rangers by accident. I did it because I like things that go boom, and I like the challenge. And it's like firefighters don't hate fires. They're like, awesome. You know, oh my gosh, it's terrible. They're going, man. And surgeons like to cut. And all of us like to do things we do well and what we love. And we don't really get that tired of them if that's what you love. Well, whether I, whether I was in the military or out um, serving God as a missionary, and you can serve God at both, I think where we are in America now, it's not so much if you're in the military that you're Nathan in King David's court, but you're Daniel in Nebuchadnezzar's court. But if God calls you, be that Daniel. Be that Daniel. And it's not over in this country. It's not even near over. God has his own way. And there are believers everywhere, up and down the chain. And so if you do get mad at the Republicans or the Democrats or anybody in between, pray for them. Pray for them. Because the best thing either party could have is to follow Jesus. And they're going to do it their way. But if they follow Jesus, it'll be okay. So that's my, my I didn't plan to talk about this, Brian, is <laughs> pray for your enemies, including political ones, because they really bug you. They bug me anyway. And pray for them and then ask God what you're supposed to do. Maybe you're supposed to run for office. Maybe you're supposed to support a candidate. Sometimes maybe you just stay and do your job. I remember I was just coming back from Burma to the States. I saw something I didn't like. I prayed about doing something. I was in the middle of it. I met this stranger on the street. He turns out to be a congressman from in Wyoming. We're on our way to rodeo because my kid's all rodeo. And we're talking, and he just out of the blue says, Dave, Hebrews 12, 14. Oh, what's that? When it at all possible, be at peace with all men and be holy. Wow. I don't have to do this. It's possible to be at peace with that issue. Second, am I holy? No. I'm not holy. The enemy starts here. And so I think that's the starting point of everything in life, including politics. Can I be holy? Can I be at peace? And then God will, don't worry about the battles. God will pick them for you and you'll be in them. They're gonna, that's going to happen. <laughs> don't go looking for them. Because you want, you want to win. And you, want, you, and you only want to do the ones God wants. So anyway, and before I forget to, Chaplain Bidog, where are you? And you're awesome. I got tons of chaplains around me here. I feel good. Jason, from a distance, you close. And right behind you is the Chaplain family. Anyway, thank God for them in the military and, and all that you've done for me in my life, both families. So we were in Burma, and my point of all this story was I like what I do. I don't do it that well, but I love it. And what we do is humanitarian relief in war zones that we're called to, which is uh, Burma, sometimes Sudan, Iraq, Syria and Tajikistan, Afghan border and Afghanistan a couple times. Those are those areas. We've been asked to many places, including Ukraine, when Ukraine kicked off. But I was in the middle of Burma, in the middle of a firefight, being attacked by Russian MiGs in, in Burma, thinking this is not my place. I got to stay with these people. But I thank God for everybody, including Larry and those in this church that went to Ukraine. So God has different places for different people. But during all my time of 
service and try to be ambassador of Jesus. Um, sometimes in pretty brutal situations like someone's trying to kill me, as in they're two yards away shooting at me. That's about as close as you can get. Well, you can get one yard away, but that gun's kind of long too. So it's like right there. And sometimes a little further, like between me and Pastor Brian. In spite of those things, I was wounded four times in Mosul. None of a major. I'm not Klebe who got just blown up like crazy. I was just fortunate. Um, I was never done. I got tired, like I need to sleep sometime. You got to eat sometime. I never got tired of it, ever. 29 years of this, ever. I've cried a lot for people we've lost. I've been scared a lot, but I never was done. But a few months ago in Burma, I don't know all the reasons why, but after one day where one of my best guys died, like that far from me, right there, I'm dragging his body, trying to get his dead body out of the fights for his parents. And we're just getting hammered. The Burma Army is approaching us from behind shooting, and they're mortaring us from another hill, and then planes are diving on us. And there's dead and dying all over. And this is going on every single day. And we're losing a kilometer every day, a new village every day. We're losing, losing. And I'm, I'm looking at young men in the morning, and of 40 of them, four will be dead. And on and on and on. And I remember when this guy died, I got back. I got blood, his blood all over me, other people's blood. I come back, and I suddenly realized one big thing. I was done. I'm done. I've never been done. And I'm more scared, like in a chronic way, not chronic, but like in a deep way, like, I don't want to go there anymore. I don't want to go out there anymore. I'm going to get killed. It's, my number's up. <laughs> and I have wife and kids and friends, and what, and what difference will it make? And then, so I'm scared, and I'm so sad. I'm just sad. And I don't want to do this anymore. And I remember I said, I have three options. I can just quit this. Because also, when I go, people follow me. And when people follow you to their deaths, which no one intended, you feel really bad. And it keeps happening. So I said, okay, I'm gonna stop this and quit it. Someone else can run this organization. They don't even need me. Actually, they don't, I, I, they do need me because we need everybody, but it doesn't depend on me. It depends on God and a bunch of great ethnic leaders. I can quit. Number two, I can just focus on killing as many Burmese as I can. Many Burma soldiers, I just focus on killing. That's the problem. Or number three, I can just make no decision except Jesus, what do you want me to do? And I picked that one because it's the only one that's ever worked in my life. And I said, Jesus, if you want me to do something tomorrow, you've got to do it because I got nothing left. Nothing. No courage, no heart, nothing. I'm like a walking dead man. And I went to sleep and I woke up ready to go. Wow. You know, in life, it doesn't always happen that fast. But it happened to me. It happened twice, actually, in the last five months. Wow, Jesus, you just did that. You must really want me here. Because <laughs> you did it, I got no problem. No problem. I cry a lot. But you know, I learned the first day in seminary. I love my professor, Chuck Kraft. He does power encounter stuff. Great professors like Gondolf, big bushy eyebrows, praying all the time. He said, you can live well with sorrow. You can't live well with shame. We can't live with shame or hate or all these other sins. You can live with sorrow. And a lot of you have lived with a lot more sorrow than I have if you lost family members which I haven't yet. You can live well with sorrow. You can cry every day for people. Jesus wept. That's about love. That sadness is about love. You can live well with it. And I love one thing about the church. We're together to share sorrows too. When someone fails, when someone breaks up, when someone dies, when someone loses their job, we're here to cry together. And I think you will cry. The closer you walk with Jesus and the older you get, you probably notice that, you cry a lot. And that's about love. That's about love. And I love that about this church. And I love that about God's church all over the world. We're together to share suffering. Doesn't sound fun, but it's very deep. I was talking about our kids rodeoing. We um, land in the States, and my girls are in college now at Texas A&M studying medical things. But they play on the polo team, the horse kind. And one of them plays rugby. They love all the sports. They're getting smoked academically, but they're passing. They're like, whoa, school's real, because they never went to it. The only reason they got there because it's Karen and God. But anyways, on the way, we're rodeoing in Wyoming. And because of they've been riding their whole lives, and they're very aggressive riders, Pete's roping now. 
the girls are, are riding barrels. That's not good enough. Because if you compete and that's, that's at the high level, you got to have a horse that's fast and knows the pattern. No one's going to give you their fast money horse. But because of Jesus, people in Wyoming, they give our girls fast money horses. Who would do that? That means they're not going to win that night. So our girls win, even win money. Pete wins money. And it's so awesome, you know, to see your kids win. It's just cool, especially when they're not supposed to. You come in from Burma, and now you're racing Americans in, in Wyoming. But the last night of the event, and, and my friend, my, our kids have these awesome Wyoming cowboys and cowgirls, toughest nails, Jesus people, awesome. And they're winners. One was a state champion, one was this, one was going to the junior NFR or whatever. All, it, they're all really good. The last night of the rodeo, they'd been winning, winning, winning. Every kid in their circle lost, including my kids. Everybody lost. It's like, what a way to end this thing. We're all standing about 10 o'clock at night outside the arena with the, with the horses. And they're all in this close circle talking. And I thought, I realized, mostly in rodeo, you lose. It just kind of dawned on me. Mostly you lose. What's keeping these people together? One, they love the competition. They're going to get up and do it again. Number two, they love their horses. They don't blame them. They did it first. If the horse fell, which my daughter's horse did, man. Total, I mean, lucky they both lived, but not lucky, a blessing. They love their horse. They love each other. They love the competition. They love each other. They love the horses. And they're all been humbled that night. All have been disappointed that night. They got each other in their loss. And I thought, that's the church. We're going to lose in life. We're going to lose. No matter how hard you try, you're going to lose sometimes but you stick together and we try again. And we realize rodeo is not the biggest thing. It's a great thing. It's a gift. This is the great thing. This is the eternal thing with Jesus in the middle. So that's the main thing I want to share tonight. And I want to show a few videos because this is one of, I feel our home churches and I'm on the surf team here. Ha ha. <laughs> you know that foamy stuff? That's what I get on. But um, I want to just get, give you an update because I haven't been here in two years, I think. And so I'm gonna I want to show a video from Karen State, Burma, that kind of mostly speaks for itself. This woman's trying to plant rice. Burma Army fires her up. We hear it because we're doing a kids program. We go out to help her plant rice. We get fired up. We creep out and plant a little bit. She gets motivated, goes out at night and plants more. And then and you'll kind of see what happens. And in this video, in case you miss it, you're gonna see three of the Burma soldiers that were shooting at us. And later ran away and then ran into us and they didn't know they were shooting at me. So when I, I did not Pete videoed it. He almost got killed. All our, our whole family's almost killed because we're out there trying to do this rice thing. And the eyes of these Burmese soldiers are enemy to this big, like, oh, you're the guy we tried to kill. Now we're in your hands. I said, awesome, man. Now we can be friends. Jesus has given you a new chance. So can we show that, that video, please? It's called Machine Guns, Widows, plant. something. The rice here, help this old lady plant the rice. And the Burma Army just opened up on us. This lady comes up to me with a sack of rice, and she said, you planted it. Last year, about six months ago, this lady, Nathrage, was trying to plant rice. The Burma Army fired her up. We went to help. We got fired up. Joseph helped me plant a little rice. She went out late at night and kept planting more, and she came back and said, this is the rice that you helped us plant. Wow. So we thank you for praying. I thank God that you're not dead. And I thank God I'm not dead. These three soldiers were actually part of the group shooting at us. Last year we were planting rice at Nalthage's field. But they said they didn't like what they were doing and they fled. And I thank God for the KNU that had mercy on them and took them in. And we pray for their new start and a new Burma. I think in the future, uh, maybe I will just stay with my family. Uh, even if the new uh, military that protecting the people that are coming up, I will be like helping with another way. Wait, well, you know. Thanks. So from there, we came back here. We were going to come here, but Afghanistan blew up. You guys are familiar with what happened. We got involved. That was all God and started trying to help people first from here. And then we went to go to Tajikistan to go to the Panjshir Valley. We've been in Afghanistan a couple times before. By the time we got to Tajikistan, Panjshir fell. So we were working through the Tajik church, which I didn't know anything about. 
And about everything we've done, not about, every single thing we've done that's any good at all to help Afghans is through the Tajik Church. Awesome believers. So please pray for them. We're in a partnership with them right now. We were there on the ground for about a month helping Afghans. And through the work, mostly the Tajik Church, they just baptized 31 Afghans that fled, which is very unusual. 31 two weeks ago or last month, and I think four last week and three more yesterday. I keep getting these texts from Tajikistan. So we're involved there with them, which is why we weren't here last summer. But then your surf team came and joined me for a little expedition up near Malibu. So I got to see some of y'all. So that work with Af Afghans is still ongoing. So please keep praying for them, and we'll keep sending updates. And the next thing, because I'm going to run out of time, I want to show this little video uh, last year when we went to Syria to rebuild a church, and it speaks for itself. Can you guys hear? Is that the video loud enough? Okay. by the Syrian Democratic Forces and these cities have been uh, controlled since four months by these forces. It's 4 February 2018 in Raqqa and this is the remains of one of the churches in Raqqa and our prayer is that it will rise again. Thanks for praying. February 2020, we're in Raqqa. This is the remains of the church that was destroyed by ISIS. And with God's help and a bunch of wonderful people, we're rebuilding it. You can see the destruction around here, and you can see the new building going up. And so we pray this gets done. In Jesus' name, amen. People like the Eubank family here and their supporters are rebuilding this church literally from the ground up. ISIS destroyed it. We will not stand for evil to overtake us in any part of the world is what this is all about. Oh, this is a big place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone who, who they support, uh, supported the, uh, the buildings of uh, the, the church for, from the beginning again. Uh, it's a great gift for us, again, to, to feel hope in Raqqa. Raqqa was the, the, the capital of, the, of ISIS in Syria and uh, Iraq. Today we are having a new, new church here. We are having a new faith by, by the support of the FBR and all the, uh, good, all the uh, good, good, good people, let's say. I, I'm speechless. <laughs> I'm so happy I'm crying. We thank God and thank you the Raqqa Civil Council, the SDF, the Armenian believers, the Arabs, the Kurds, the Christians, everyone who came together, William who introduced us to this, Bashir, all the donors, thank you so much. We praise God for the dedication of the Armenian Apostolic Church here in Raqqa on 10 November 2021. God bless you all. Thanks.
So that was a total miracle. And because, don't be too afraid, because it's only a couple of extra minutes. Pastor Brian said I have a couple extra minutes. There's one thing I want to back up. What's that? Okay, <laughs> don't worry. Um, I wanted to share one story that I, I just skipped over because of time um, about Afghan, Afghanistan. So we went to respond there because God opened up a relationship between us. The, the president of Afghanistan fled right away and the whole airport debacle happened. And we were in the States at that point talking Americans and others into the airfield any way we could. A lot of people were doing that, maybe some of y'all. And then we, and then I got in a relationship with the, the vice president who became the president, um, Rula Saleh, um, connected by a friend of mine named Laura Logan, who's a journalist. And so we don't know each other. He said, you know, I know the Freedom Rangers come and help us. So we're going to go to the, so we went to Tajikistan, we're going to the Panjshir Valley and we're going to do normal FBR stuff. We're going to be there, boom, boom, bang, bang, and trying to help people. Well, that whole thing collapsed and he ended up having to escape and we met in Tajikistan. Um, so we're working with the, with the Tajik church, helping Afghans and also directly with the Afghan government, what was left of it. And Amrullah Saleh shared a story with me that I want to share with y'all. He's a Sufi Muslim. That's kind of a more mystical, charismatic Muslim. And he said, to ask my wife, are you, before I tell you this story, are you a missionary? And, and we're told, you know, from our experience in Afghanistan, you never use that word there. She goes, I'm a follower of Jesus. And no, 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 are you a missionary? Yes. He asked me, I'm this, this, and this. Are you a missionary? Yes, I want to be an ambassador of Jesus. Okay, you're missionaries, I trust you. You have pure souls. He didn't say pure anything else, pure souls. And I trust you. As I was alone in the Panjshir Valley, I'd lost everything. I have $23 million in my house. I can't take it. My family luckily escaped. My brother's just been shot by the Taliban. We actually watched that happen and by a feed. And then they're all after me because I'm the president now. They hate me. I'm target number one for the Taliban. I got nobody left on this little sheep herder's house. I have my $200,000 go bag, a pistol, and two iPhones. And I said, God, God, I've been faithful to you my whole life. I've been trying to rebuild this country. I've been abandoned by my friends. I've been abandoned by the Americans. Even my soldiers fled. You know, oh my gosh, what about you, God? And then I said, I poured out my complaint to God with tears. And then God's presence filled the room. And I saw writing in front of my eyes, in my language, in Dari, like this. And it said, I love you. You're mine, but you don't really trust me. You haven't given me everything. Wow. So I called the sheep herder in, or wherever he was. I gave him the 200,000, gave him my pistol, gave him my two phones, and said, is that enough, God? He said, now you trust me. And he said, I started to cry, and I went to sleep for the first time 12 hours straight. I hadn't slept in 17 years, more than two or three hours, for a variety, without sleeping pills. I woke up to the sound of tanks. And if you'd ever been to the Panjshir, or no, that's a narrow valley. Eight yards from my window was the street and seven tanks were coming up it. And they're looking for me, it's Taliban. And I opened the window, I was not afraid. Open the window wide, they know exactly what I look like. I just smiled at them, I was not afraid. I was in God's hands and they did not recognize me. They went on by. So God has something for me to do. And he said, you all, the Freedom Rangers, it's too soon for you now. We lost everything, but thanks for being with us. So I don't know what the future is, but I wanted to share with you all how God speaks to people, regardless of their titles and what they think or not. God wants a heart after his heart. And so we could share about Jesus and what Jesus has done for us. And please pray for Amrullah Saleh. I love this man. So the last video I'm going to show, it's um, I didn't make it. FBR didn't make it. But a friend of ours who knew a girl named Elizabeth who dies in this video and just wanted to make a tribute. This was done, she made this back in April, right before, um, right before Easter. And at that point, we'd lost, I think, five of our Rangers. We, we've actually lost 13 now. But it's a tribute to these people that were lost. You'll see Elizabeth, this beautiful, awesome lady. She's gonna get killed when she goes to respond to an airstrike and the Burma Army follows up with mortars. And You'll see Rito, you'll see me actually dragging him because he's dead. Um, he's very close to my daughter. You'll see her in one of the images. But it's a tribute to different people that died. But there's also the gospel through it and the, and the power of the resurrection. And I thank you for letting us share our sorrows and our joys with you. 
I've learned this. When we share sorrows and people share them with us, they're divided. We share joys, they're multiplied. And so it's mostly a big joy <laughs> to be with y'all. And I want to close with this video.
So thanks for, thanks for the extra time. <laughs> and thanks for letting us share tonight um, our sorrows and our joys. In spite of those sorrows, we mostly have joy. I love those people. And I love being with them. We're going from here to see the girls and then go to, to Syria, back to Syria, and then back to Burma. But I also love y'all just as much as I love the people of Burma. And when I see you, I don't know everybody here, but I know some of y'all, I think, oh, these are just as cool to me. Um, God has called us to a different place, but I always thank God when I can come back and see y'all here and that we are one family in Christ. And on this earth, we're part of his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And there is a heaven and we get to go there. But now we have things to do. So thank you, Pastor Brian. I'm going to invite up uh, Romolo and the worship team. We've been, uh, we just started actually uh, for the four Sundays of, uh, and the four Wednesday nights of September. Uh, we're doing a thing called Operation Unity and it's really uh, just getting in small groups and, and uh, within our church. But this first week we were talking about sacrificial love. And uh, when it worked out for Dave to be able to, uh, when we found out that he was able to come, and I thought this is the perfect week for that, uh, because truly what Free Burma Rangers is all about is, uh, as it says in John's gospel, there's no greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for a friend, or at least being willing to. And uh, it really just uh, uh, personifies what their, what their ministry is all about. So Dave, Karen, Pete, uh, we love you guys, and thank you for what you do. And uh, just it reminds us, and just seeing the videos and everything else, uh, maybe all the more how to pray for you guys, and, and, uh, and what we all ought to be just sensitive to, because they're in a different time zone and everything else. You might wake up at two o'clock in the morning thinking, why the heck am I awake? Pray for these guys right here. <laughs> just pray for them. They might be going through something at the time. There's been times where I've texted, he says, oh, that was, thanks for the prayers. This is what's happening, you know? And uh, we, we, we can all be sensitive to that in the spirit. So let's all stand for our last song and let's worship him. Mm -hmm. 